stuff that we're doing in here as temporary jigs. Now this one, I'm going to keep this. And this one, because this one's so good looking. <laughs> yeah. And each one of them we have for a specific purpose. When we are, let me turn this one around and just do the one at a time. Okay. When we are making this thing, like you said, we use the domino instead of making the mortise and tenon like we did the other cases. <laughs> So on the end of this, we have a flat board goes across here where we cut on each side. And I'm not sure if you're familiar with the domino yet, but it's sort of like a biscuit joiner. You have a particular block that goes inside. So for us to make it in the right area, we took the handles, made a jig that this set on. So we take this part here, clamp it to the table so it wouldn't move. We put this on here and we marked it in the center, the flat spot. And put the domino on there, and that's how we cut the dominoes out. So it was just a one time jig that we said we'll probably do it again it's because we made this was the pattern that we put for the top. So we started off with this block, put the thing on here, cut it out with a bandsaw after marking it, put it on here, and that's how we cut the domino. So that was this part of it. And then when we got ready to do the cane itself, we put this over there. All this is going to do is hold the end of this in place. You know, this is down, so it won't move. And then you'd end up with, on this end, this part sticking out over the bench. We marked it in and we hit the domino on there. It was a really easy process to do those on there. We saved a lot of time over using the mortise and tenon last year because we had to use the mortising machine for the two ends of the handle. And then we had to do this, and then we had to fit them together one for one for every one because you're doing it manually. You had to get it on there. So this is once we had this done, pretty much any handle because we we make, cut all these blocks, and after we cut out the blocks on here, every one, you know, that we put the tenon on, it was all in the same exact place. And it made it a lot easier for us. Anyway, that was one of our type of jigs. The handle on the last one went in the other direction where this hook sat, and you put it on there. Now the way this came up with an angle, if you put it there your handle was going to be offset from the, the cane there and it was awkward looking. So we turned it around like this so you know you hold it and it was more in line. Next time we're going to straighten out where you have an angle on here, we're going to go straight with it and then we, we could turn it around the other way and look at it. So we're debating about next time. We, we, we do want to do another batch of it, you know, because they they were completely out of these for a while. So we'll give them these 90 something probably within the next couple of weeks and they'll be on there. Anyway, let me get this stuff out of the way. These were stools, um, a jig for cutting out stools. My daughter wanted us to do it for a nursery class and Bob came over, we, he went over on I think Delta Cat we used and we figured out how many of this shape part here that we could get out of one sheet of plywood. And we used like a, I think it was only half inch or maybe a little bigger plywood but we could get a whole lot of them out of one sheet of plywood. So you put this on there and the jig that cut it out with was, we use this as a sample. <laughs> and, but you know, we, we had a board this shape, this is the exact shape we put on the side. It fits onto here where you can see it on there. We, we put it on here and something, like I said, they're, they're like half inch boards or more. We put that on there, one on each side. And then we had a board set here and a board set here. And by the time you just attach it together through the sides, you'd end up pulling this out of the way and you had a stool set in there. Yeah. We, we made probably around 30 or something like that the first time. And we gave it to all the, the it's a preschool. We gave it to all the classes, the kids painted them up or somebody painted them up and then they had an auction and you know went out there and sold them to everybody, which I thought was great, except for the ones that I was making, it wasn't cost me any money. I made them, and then my wife went to the auction and bought two of them. It cost me like a hundred something dollars for stools that I made and gave yeah. to them. Mine, mine are somewhat limited because I only do one thing in my shop. I'm not a woodworker. I just play with wood. Uh, this, this, this has been a great 
<coughs> addition to my, my work. I have a lot of small parts that I have to sand, and I have a lot of small parts with, with holes in the center that have to be sanded. So I came up with this, and uh, this, is an, this is an adjustable. They have these on the tail here. They have a plastic, a flat plastic thing on here, so I changed that to rubber. But this will clamp anything from a very thin piece up to like three quarters or more, so you can clamp it, clamp it. You don't have to adjust it each time you change it, the thickness of it. Uh, I made this, and I made it so that it has a hole in the side. You can pick your, hook your vacuum to it, which I have never done. Because <laughs> the stuff that comes down on there, I just vacuum it off the top. But uh, it's helped me a lot in, in sanding small parts. Another, another item I'll use a lot of, and I've made a lot of these, so if anybody wants one, let me know. This is for my glue. You know, when you, you take your, your glue and, and stand it upright, and uh, every time you start to use it, you've got to shake it like this to get it down. With this one, I just, I just take it and turn, the, the cap fits in here, turn it upside down and stand it in that, and it, uh, it's a good idea to put some wax paper or something under there because eventually, sometimes the cap will drop off, and, I, and the one I'm using at home, I, every once in a while, I take a putty knife and go in there and cut, and cut it loose. But these are, these are the spreaders. So you tops in there, you just take that out and put it in and, and spread it. I'll put it between the parts when you're hooking all those parts together. The third, third item is this. Several years ago, one of, the, one of the woodworking shows, I saw a guy demonstrating these. He was selling them. And uh, my son and I were looking at it. And I, I looked at it long enough to kind of get some ideas, so I went home and made a couple, one for him and one for me. Uh, it's, it's a complete, it, it's for the uh, table saw, and uh, it has the, it has the uh, ruler on there so you can, you, can set, you can set this at any length you want. Of course, when I, when I use that, I, I cut a lot of pieces at one time. <coughs> this is also made so that, that that's a 22 and a half degree, 30 degree, 45 degree, and, and 60 degree cut. So you can set it in, in, in between. And I've used this an awful lot in a few years I've had it. $179. Is that what they were? Uh, they, they're, they're worth every penny of it, too. <laughs> <laughs> in other words, it wasn't that easy to make? It's all about it. Okay, great. Hey, George. How did you how did you cut the perfect arc? For, did you just use a router and a template for that, or how? Did you yeah. And I'm not I'm not good with the router. General, generally, I, I I don't use a router very much because I don't know how to use them. But I did did manage to get that in there. The first thing that George showed for holding your small parts under for sanding and stuff for doing the tires and things like that, he got done with that and then. Uh, we made one at my shop, Marcus got one at his shop, Hans has got one, and Buzz. So a lot of people, yeah, yeah. You know, so a lot of people end up making it afterwards, small items. Okay, this is not a totally original idea, but I needed to make circles on the table saw. So on the bottom, it's just, you know, the strip that goes in the slot. This part, is a, this part is just so you can push, you know, you have something to hang on to. And what I did is, this is, I marked off like the radiuses of my circle, and I drilled holes not all the way through. I didn't want the bottom of this to be rough on the table saw. And then, then I had a little issue in the, in the, what I saw on the internet, they just had a nail and I wanted something tighter than a nail and it also wouldn't, you know, stick from the other side. So I figured I wanted a dowel. But then I also had a problem. I needed to, to, to get something deep. You see, some circles are too big to fit on my drill press. So I needed be, to be able to drill a straight hole, which I used this for. It has a different drill bit. And I wanted about a quarter of an inch. See, this is this is the piece of wood I start out with, and it's like a quarter. So I wanted like about a quarter inch diameter. So I needed to find a quarter inch 
drill bit, which was long enough to go through this and then to go through the wood. And the problem is, the only one of these I was able to find was 1564, it's not exactly a quarter. So I couldn't just buy a dowel. So I made this pin on my 3D printer. That's the most advanced thing I made so far with my 3D printer. <laughs> so what you do is, okay, so this is like a, I think a six inch board. So you put this, and I should have put it, you need a pliers, which I didn't bring. Maybe you should have started off with that one that was smaller. <laughs> oh, thank you. I did make it tight because I didn't want it to slip. Still slipping. Okay. Thank you. So you put this in the three since I want a six inch diameter and you just put this over the hole. If you can see it. Okay, so you put it over the hole and then you do your first cut like this. You go around in quarters. Then you just keep going around and chipping off a little bit at a time and eventually, this is a different size, but eventually you end up with a circle when you're done. All so, on the table All on the table, sure. so you just keep spinning it around and you push it, you go like this, push it, and as you chip off, you get smaller and smaller and eventually you can just spin it, you put, position it and just spin it around and you end up with a real circle. The purpose for this, obviously, a lot of people have made this to go over your um, miter fence, and I, I made several of them, but this had a particular purpose. We were making these boxes, lidded boxes, you know, that were different sizes, and they had a, one with a really nice top on it, and if you've seen the tops, they go at an angle. It, it, it comes up on the bottom of the edge about that high and then it goes up at an angle on all four sides and then flattens out on top and it makes a beautiful lid to on top of each box. In order to make that, I had to put this on my fence and cut that thing at an angle. So I put notes on here that tells me I need to put a nine degree tilt on the blade and I go one and nine sixteenth off the fence. You know, so I set my fence to one and nine sixteenth on, on the tape on there. I have a nine degree slot, and when I put this on onto the fence, this will catch the wood on here. This part will be flat on here. It's just a perfect distance away, and then that part will be a slot. So when I run it through, I can safely cut my angles. But this way doing it, you can control because there's a lip on the back here. When you're completely flat with the, the thing on here, you can actually clamp it onto the top and know that you're perfect, push it through there safely, we we're able to make the angle perfect and it's repeatable because I wrote a note on this one, unlike the other part that we have no idea what we made it for. But, all right. I like making boxes. So I've got several things here. Here's a typical box with splines in it. Sometimes these are really large, so I, I made this simple, simple jig, both that there. Put your um, dovetail bit here, and it cuts that that spline. Just a, just a 45 degree with a 90 degree on it, and that slides slide the bit through, and you you can get that spline right there. Now, if you look at the thickness, to, Larry, you ever go close to the edge or anything? Like, how do you keep it from going off? You well, you uh, around, this is centered, so you can put it wherever you want and bolt it to the the box, especially if it's a large box. Now, that sounds like fun, but instead, let's do it on a router table. So here, I made this this jig, which is nothing more than a sled with two boxes in it. You put this right there. You raise your router bit, slide it through, turn it over, if these are locked down, slide it through and it puts this key in it that way. That's fun. Now, let's talk about splines. We can do splines on a router table, but I like to do them on a table saw because it's so much cleaner. So here is a 
spline jig big enough to put a box in like this box here right and you'd be running splines this way most people make box joints on a router to me a router is a portable tool because i don't have a router table um so my good friend bob aldea showed me how to make box joints with a table saw First lesson that I learned, and anybody who wants to argue with me, they're more than welcome to. Every manufacturer of a table saw who puts some machined ways in for your miter gauge, for anything else that you slide in there, the only thing that's uniform is the width and the depth of that machined way. Don't ever believe the distance from the throat. Don't ever believe the distance between them. So Bob now has two. The one he had that fits his Delta Unisaw and the one that I built on his Delta Unisaw for him because it doesn't fit my Powermatic. And so I built this one for the Powermatic, copying his. I'm not going to challenge him because he is legendary for, for building jigs. I didn't see the YouTube. He may have designed it himself. I didn't see it on YouTube. I copied his. I just loaned this a week ago to Don Bedell. I said, do you want to know the YouTube? And he said, no, I'll just copy yours. Here we go again with a lesson, you know. So Bedell had to make two. He started and he said, darn, you're right. Should have listened. So what happens is, do you all know what box joints are? Box joint blades are? Yeah. If you don't have them, it's great. Uh, the instructions on it say, you can have it either quarter inch or three eighths. If you lock the blades this way, put the label out, lock the blades this way with the label in, they're exactly flat top. Nowhere in the instructions does it say whether or not you can use one. So I didn't try it. I don't want to see one of the carbide tips come flying off. I don't want to find out that the blade isn't strong enough. But what happens is you glue a spacer here to match which, whichever combination you're doing for the joints. as far as spacing, and then you move it over to the next one. This will end up being sacrificial, so I made several of them. This is a piece of tempered mace knight. And this is one piece with the next spacer glued on. And it works the same as everybody else who's done one on the, on the router table, but like I said, I don't have a router table. Move it over. Slide it again, move it over, slide it again. This is what allows me to replace the, the plate for the other combination. And there's a fine adjustment screw. It was easy, it was fun. Um, I suppose you can probably find it on YouTube. Sir? What are you saying? You replace the whole face of it for the different sizes? Is that what you do? Yes, this, this piece of MDF, uh -huh. the piece of mace knight on the bottom, and my little glued guy. Can you tell what I'm doing here? I'm just going to take this off. Yeah. Any questions? So you have one of those for a quarter and you have one of those for a three-eighths? Right? I do, as dictated by this set of blades. I don't know if other people other than Freud make uh, box joint blades, and if they say flip it this way and it's quarter and this way it's half, then I would end up doing that. But in my way, that's the only choice I have. Turns out that Don Bedell used um, a thin kerf blade that he swears is topped off flat. Because my comment to him was if it wasn't, you're going to have to take some sawdust and glue. Because you're going to see it to me, just like you know, a hand cut dovetail at my skill level, you can tell it's hand cut. 
And I'm afraid that's what it would look like if, if you used a normal combination blade. Yeah, Freud's uh, glue line rip that I leave, leave on my saw, yeah. it's, it's flat on top. And it's, you, it's top. you didn't have to have a machine to, to be that one? No, no, they're, oh. they're made that way. Then you know another one. But there's several blades, Freud, most of them are not. That one. Right, most blades I've ever seen yeah. are not. Yeah, that one's completely square on top there. Well, then that must be what uh, Will Bedell uses. I feel like I'm in some kind of a 12-step program meeting here where you're announcing I'm, I'm a woodworker, I'm recovering. <laughs> okay, um, what this device here is, I had a need uh, quite some time ago to do some fluting of molding because I wanted to make my own but I didn't find a, a piece down at Pierce and Pierce that would, uh, that would do the job. So. I had this idea, I think I may have seen a picture of it on you know, the internet or something like that, <coughs> using uh, two strips of wood on a, you know, on a router face, a router template. So I thought, well, shoot, I think I can make that. The principle behind the thing is to use the, the face on the router, you, uh, you know, pop that off with you know, unscrewing three screws. Lay this thing down on your on your piece of polycarbonate, and don't try this with acrylic. You you will crack it. But polycarbonate works just about like metal, you know, aluminum or something like that. Just use the same rules. You can drill it, and tap it, do all that kind of stuff. But anyway, what I did is I traced all the appropriate holes in the in the pattern or in the uh, the original faceplate, matched them, and punched them in there. And I even went so far with the faceplate that I was using at the time to cut in uh, a receiver in there for the bushings that would normally be used with a porter cable uh, router. But in this particular case, I didn't need such a thing. Uh, recently, I just uh, had occasion to cut a sliding dovetail. I don't know if any of y'all have attempted such a thing before, but it's uh, it requires a you know fair amount of precision and skill. So, what you would normally do with that is capture capture your piece that you're going to cut the sliding dovetail in, you know, slide it through there, and then uh, decide how you're going to reorient it to cut the the other side of the sliding dovetail. In this particular case, it's a you know it's a five mil or I mean a five degree angle. So uh, that's how you would adjust these blocks. You would adjust those back and forth as needed to be able to get your your workpiece over there close to where you need. Then. Uh, just a week or two ago, I had a, a real challenge, which was cutting a sliding dovetail in a piece that was curved. And I about burned out my brain trying to figure out how to accomplish that. So there wasn't much of a curve to this piece. So what I wound up doing is I put some spacers in here, which you can see right there. And I double stick taped them. And then, similar to a cam follower, I put one on the other side. That way I could put my, my curved piece in there with the inside of the curve on the, on the follower side and the, the you know, outside of the curve out here and slide the thing through there so that it accomplishes the curve as you're pushing it through. Now, are you modding that in, in a uh, work mate or in a vise or are you using it as a true route? Using it as a true router, I, I clamp my, my work piece, okay. you know, whatever, I'm, whatever it is I'm cutting, I, I clamp that thing down pretty severely, and then take it, just flip this over, you know, run it down the, down the slot till you're happy with what you got there, you know, make whatever adjustment is necessary to cut the other side of the, the dovetail, <coughs> and then you've got the, uh, you've got the sliding dovetail. The, the, the receiver part of it. 
than for uh, for cutting the other the other piece that's going to make to it. Um, usually, what I'll do is do that on a router table because it, it's usually too small to to get something like this involved. All right, the the principle of this is to show that uh, you don't have to be stuck with your original plate that comes with your router. You can remove that top and you can put a plate on there to accomplish whatever it is you can you can think of. Yes, sir. Did you, did you try uh, duplicating the curve of whatever your piece was for your guides so that whenever you went around it, did the curve guide would follow your work piece? Yeah, I considered that, but since I only had two of them to do, I, I decided give this a try. It it worked well enough. But yes, if I had to make more of them, yes, I, I would definitely uh, build a new uh, guide that nice would have the same here. curvature as the piece I was trying to cut. Yes, sir. Is there any way you can adapt that idea to cutting flutes in a round table leg on a way? I needed to do that for a granite top table and I ended up buying the leg I already made. I saw a, just saw a YouTube on that using a, they were using a router and they had they mounted they mounted it on the leg. Mm -hmm. And then the index and, and, and then used right, the, you ran it down the index into the And they used one. the index. I would imagine with with a taller guide like that so that you could trap both sides of the leg. Uh, you could you could do it that way. Now, if you introduce a taper in there, that's a whole different, <laughs> whole different challenge. Wouldn't that be the same as Don Bedell's uh, legacy? I guess so, yeah. That makes me for that putting mm -hmm. whatever post Breaking on there, it yeah. and it adjusts and it'll move the different incrementally. Yeah, yeah it sounds like a function that's ideal for a duplicator. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. it's like piece of yeah. But you can fabricate something to do that. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. It would be cheaper. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Rob had someone, we, we discussed this before, I had someone that needed um, pocket crosses. And there are two ways you could do that. You could actually cut the cross this way and this way and then put a lap joint in the middle and exactly the thickness of the cross. What I came up with was something for the bandsaw. This is perfectly square. The cross fits down in here. I uh, run it into the bandsaw off the fence turn it, run it, turn it, run it again, and then I take the piece out, turn it over, and that cuts the bottom half of the cross and you end up with with that small pocket cross. Why can't you cut that on a scroll saw? Well, on a scroll saw, we did a whole lot of them. We did, we did a hundred of them, and on a scroll saw, you're not perfectly straight like my template. <laughs> follow line, follow line. Yeah, I mean they're, they're manufactured in China, okay, versus handmade. <laughs> it was just, uh, the, the trick was to make sure that the distances were equal on all sides of the box, so when you run it down the fence, it came out. That's a lot more complicated than what you think of, because when you had to figure it out each side, the distance from here, this cut, is different than this one. And like you did to one side, then you flipped across over so you could do the top of the parts on the side, and then the bottom part and everything. The original thought was doing separate jigs. You know, one's to do the, the sides on one side, one for the other one, and then he brought it over the next day, or a couple of days later when we got to that point. And uh, the biggest thing was, I promised this lady I'd do that, didn't know when, and then she called me up like the day before it was due, said, can I come by tomorrow and pick those up? <laughs> So, Larry. wait a minute, he, he knew about it for a week, I knew about it for 24 hours. Let me end you something. Wouldn't it have been easier if you just take a rectangular piece of wood and put your racket on all four corners and then just slice them off on the miter top? The type uh, of wood I The have. next time I do it, I'll run the, I'll take a long board, I'll run it through a router, and, and you're right. Yeah. It would have been easier, but we didn't have, we, this came out, the grain, for one thing, changes when you, when you do that, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. So we did, it this, we did it this way. We did it this way so the grain was in the right direction as reinforcement. I tried the other way, and the tops and the bottoms would, 
the cleave at the. Uh, well, you have to yeah. take all right. Yeah. But yes, that's the other way you could do it. Do it like a long bore and then slice it off. And then you wouldn't have the saw marks on the side. Well, the, there's not a whole lot of saw marks on there. Okay. You got a question back there? No, I was just asking since you've got three different lengths on there, did you put a stop on your, uh, on your bandsaw? So that you same same stop. There? Same stop all the way around. There's, because it's just where the location is on the that distance part from of the here board. to here and the distance from there to there is the same. It's the same. That was that was the math that took me a little yeah. long to figure it out. Here. I know that doesn't apply to you, but pass it on. Yeah. <laughs> and try not to catch it with the sharp edges. Yeah. yeah well, we, 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 we're trying to make a star David on there, and we just couldn't yeah. do it. <laughs> well, mine is a quickie. For mortising hinges. It's a simple jig to make for different size hinges. And like Rob pointed out, right on it what the setup is. So you remember, because these often end up in my firewood pile. And then the other hinge jig I made, I, I got volunteered to replace the uh, inset doors on somebody's antique console. Oh yeah, sorry. Some people just don't follow directly. Rotate it, aim it at the... Yeah, okay, like that. So anyway, uh, this antique console had um, they called knife hinges on it, and somebody had broken the doors. I think the kids got carried away with it. So I had to figure out a way to make hinges to where the doors, inset doors, you know, an overlay door is simple, but an inset door you've got to have a reveal the same. And so there were four doors. So I made a, a, a jig that you could lay on the door, and these guide pins. I really like these dowel pins because you can lay this on the edge and then you've got uh, a registered hole for the hinges because all you really need to do is drill a pilot hole for the hinge and then on the edge of the console just flip it over and do it the other way and they, since these were drilled to match the hinges I was using you knew that the hinges were going to be where you put them and this was the size of the open. So it, it made it simple to do what I thought was first going to be a complicated job. That's, whoops, that's mine. Very good. Okay. My problem is you can never have enough clamps, and I had clamps all over the shop, and I, I'm always trying to go around and find out where they are. They're gathering dust and so I finally decided I better do something about it. And <clears throat> as usual, I got carried away. <laughs> so while I was making a clamp rack, I figured, uh, you know, I need to move it around the shop. So that's on rollers. <clears throat> And while I was at it, I made shelves in between. So I put my drills and my <coughs> sander and whatever else, my bits and uh, everything. So now I pretty much have everything I need and I just roll it around my shop to wherever I'm working. And I don't have to go to my drawer or to my shelf or wherever toolbox or whatever. I've got it all right there. Yeah. And uh, you, you need more clamps. Though. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I actually do. <laughs> I run out of clamps frequently. But uh, I, this turned out to be much more useful than I thought it would be. I use this all the time. What was the wood? I just, I, that, that's all made out of uh, two by sixes cut down into two by twos and uh, screwed together, glued together. I painted it, yeah, there's some half inch plywood for the shelves. Uh, the bottom is two by sixes sliced in half, and uh, so it's pretty. I didn't spend a lot of money on it. Spent a lot of time on it, <laughs> cutting the cutting the angles. It's a it's a nine degree uh, angle on there. Uh, you can see the the height of it. So, like I say, I was, uh, I, it was just, originally I just needed a place to put my clamps, and now that's my rolling, uh, everything, everything yeah. place. <laughs> that's a good idea. Having it on wheels is really fine, 
uh, if you have the open floor space to roll it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That's a major problem. <laughs> Just a question. Have you ever thought of like putting holder for your portable drills and things like that? So you had one place to go to drill a hole, clamp it, etc. I, I have drill bits on there and on the other side you can't see it. I have some magnetic uh, strips where I put like my putty knives and so forth. I'm also going to look at putting uh, strips with uh, drill bits in there so they're, uh, well, they're with me as well. Just to hold the cord of the drill. The drills, I just put them on the shelf on the bottom, but I, I could make a rack for that too. Anyway, uh, that's it. Uh, All right, I got two jigs for a bandsaw. Uh, people who were here for the safety class last week saw this one. I don't know if you've ever had an opportunity to uh, cut round pieces on your bandsaw, uh, particularly if you want to cut off small pieces off that round stock. Uh, you need something like this. And the reason is, I've actually had this happen to me before, cutting a limb, okay, and it jerked it right out of my hand, hit the wall and bounced back at me. And all this does is add some stability Okay, and it doesn't have to be complex. I cut the V with the table saw, and then cut the piece out to mat to fit on my uh, miter gauge for the uh, bandsaw. So now I put this right up against the fence. I can take my uh, piece and slide it out as far as necessary, and then just run it through. And my hands are in the way, and doesn't have the opportunity to come flying out unless you're just not hanging on to it. You use, uh, use like finger pressure on the, on the wood? Yeah, just finger pressure like this, yeah. And that's sufficient? Now, yeah. Now, this wouldn't be sufficient for a big piece. All right, if you're cutting a, a limb like that, you would want something more substantial than this, okay? But that, like a small dowel or something like that is fine. This is another bandsaw jig. <coughs> And I tend to keep my jig simple, but this one is probably one of the most complex ones I made only because it's got a slot in the end and a piece that fits inside the slot that slides back and forth. The fender washer and the screw just locks it down. What it is for is taking a uh, square piece, you drill a hole in this side that you're going to hollow out, it's basically a bowl blank uh, jig, and <laughs> this fits on the table. And by the way, it's so tight that I have to sort of hammer it down and I need to round off the corners or something. And your blade is only uh, a sixteenth of an inch or so from the edge of this. You can get it even closer if you want, but then you put your blank on here with the hole in there and you can adjust this back and forth depending on the size of your blank. Then all you have to do is take the blank turn the bandsaw on of course take the blank and rotate it around and you wound up with a round piece now i don't know about you whether you like to knock off corners on your lathe or not but i don't i just soon start with a round piece you can of course buy blanks that way but uh, that way you can make your own okay so that is not sitting in the track it's on both sides of your whole table. yeah that's right these two fit on the sides of the table Okay, that's fine. All right. So my table, my bandsaw table is that wide. Okay. So I just sit it down on the, and these hold it in place. Uh, and, and you have a track underneath. The track underneath goes into the track. That track that it, it, it doesn't rock with that. Oh, this track is to keep it from uh, going back and forth. Right, right. This is tight enough, though, that it doesn't move anyway. Yeah. <laughs> that, line, that, that fits in a track just to keep okay. it from going like this, so back and forth. Flat, yeah. It ends up being flat on the table. Yeah, and also doesn't move on you. All right. I started not to bring this because, uh, well, everybody's seen a cutoff sled, haven't they? <laughs> this is just a cross cut jig. Very simple, fits on the table saw. I've got wooden guides. By the way, I did this for my uh, Delta contractor saw. It doesn't work on my uh, <laughs> new saw. <laughs> so I gotta redo it. You gotta be careful about that because you can't just take this and put it on a different saw because there might be different spacing in your miter gauge slots. And another thing about this, this was an old blade and it was a thicker cut 
now I use a Freud uh, blue line rip. This wouldn't work because it's not a zero clearance. I'd have to redo it for the thinner blade. All right. So how many of these are you going to do? Quite frankly, I don't use it anymore because I've got a regular arm saw and I got a chop saw. So most of my cross cutting is done on the radial arm saw or the chop saw. This sits over in the corner and collects dust for the most part because I haven't redone it to fit my new saw. Yeah. This is my version of finger joint jig and it's pretty simple. All right. Uh, not nearly as complex as what we saw earlier. But, uh, and by the way, I used it for two different size finger joints. That's why there's two different size slots in it. Uh, I wouldn't recommend cutting three quarter inch finger joints. I did it once, but I wouldn't recommend, I wouldn't Maybe do it again. Two by sixes. Yeah. <laughs> One thing, it's really hard to hold the pieces in place without them moving. You know, I could have put some saw sandpaper on this fence and I could have clamped them down, but you have to loosen clamps, move it, loosen clamps, move it. And I was making drawers with finger joints, that's what I was doing. I had three quarter inch stock. I thought, well, I'll, I'll just modify my jig and I'll put a separate fence here and use the separate fence for the three quarter inch finger joints. This was originally designed for quarter inch finger joints and that's what you're seeing for the smaller hole and finger here. The neat thing about this, you can cut both pieces at one time. <clears throat> and the way you do that is, and I borrowed uh, the sample, I couldn't find my sample this morning. The way you do this is, this is the same thickness as this piece. So you put it here, you slide your pieces up against it, pretend like that slot's not there right now, okay? And you cut through the two pieces like this, then you remove the slot, the uh, extra finger, and you move it over, okay? And then you cut your next set. And you just, then you can just start indexing the whole thing. These are a little bit narrower than what I've got here. Originally, I was doing this with a dado set. So again, I do have the Freud uh, finger joint set now. And it's probably, uh, this is probably a little different than what my dado <coughs> set was originally. So again, I'd probably have to redo this. And again, I want to emphasize even with the uh, smaller thickness stuff, you need some sort of non-slip surface here, all right? And you also need to really hang on to these things because imagine when you run this through your saw and it slips. Well, now you've got firewood. You might as well toss it away because it's, once it's slipped, the slots are not going to fit together right. Yeah. This is fine for small pieces, maybe even this tall, you know, but if you've got something this big, you'd want a bigger fence than what you've got here. Just to make, and the only caveat about this stuff is make sure that this surface is a right angle, you know? And that it's, this is pair, uh, at a right angle to your blade, all right? That's relatively easy to set up by adjusting your, again, your runners. And these are wood. Uh, I quit using wood, I started using uh, high density poly stuff because it slides better. The problem with wood uh, slides, they swell and they shrink <laughs> with the weather. Sometimes they won't fit in your slots. Sometimes they will, but they, you, hopefully they're long enough that it doesn't do this on you, you know, as you're running it through. So you need uh, metal guides or some uh, other uh, material that won't do that. Another safety thing, that's thick enough so that my blade doesn't come through on the back side. All right, you can make it even thicker if you want. The safety thing, if I accidentally run this thing all the way through, it's not going to hurt anything unless I got my hand back here. You know, but I'd never run it that far because you can see I've never run it past there. And I, what I usually do is put a stop on the table so it won't go any further than that. Sometimes some people put a big, a big block back there. Yeah, you can actually make this as thick or make a box yeah. so that the blade does not come up through it and you possibly get your hand can you in contact with the blade. And Alex has always got to make something complicated. It's <laughs> <laughs> only something simple, actually. So I like making circles. 
um, whether it's on a bandsaw or my router table. Okay, so when I came in um, April 29th, I did a, um, a router table that didn't actually fit. Oh, thank you. Okay. So I, I, did, I, I redid it again where I wanted the, um, to put a plate for the, um, the router, to, for the router to hold on to. Um, so I made, it was a disaster the first time. Um, so what I ended up doing, I, I redid it and then um, did the plate out of plexiglass and so it sets in better. Um, and so the router is in there and in the plate right in there. And to, in order to make the circles to actually um, to fit the, um, the plate in and also the groove, I used a, a jig for my router, my trim router. And it attached it to on top of the router there. So this is it right here. So the simple jig, normally I usually take a, um, a nail or a, a, a screw or whatever. And obviously you set your router in there and then you put your pivoting point in there, drill the hole in the um, item that you're gonna that you're gonna drill, and then just rotate the router and cut out the um, the circle. So this one I had to do, I did it a couple times, and then I had to make the, um, to get the plate, obviously it's one dimension, and to get this circle in here, I had to move the, uh, the pivot point, the distance of the, um, the router bit over in here, get the right dimension of this, this piece in here. And so I had to do it a couple times and drill a hole to each part or whatever. So it's, it's, it's kind, of, kind of complicated after a while. But I end up with a, a decent, um, a decent holder router plate that holds a router in it here, and it's nice and flush. So I did a couple of passes, and also to get the um, the center part out, I just used the um, the scroll saw and cut that part out. Now the annoying part is when you do something that simple, you have to keep drilling the holes each time. So I wanted to make something that's more um, flexible, that I'm able to do multiple um, dimensions without anything. So you know, I go online, and there's always the they, they have the um, the adjustable type where where, it's, where the the knob slides. So this I'm just using a, a knob with a um, this one is a three sixteenths inch um, bolt um, on there, and it's just a nut on there, and so I route it out. The, the groove in here to fit the, the nut. And on top here, I just cut it with, the, um, with a circular saw a couple times to get that slot. And so this will give me any sort of dimension. So I'll be able to do all the way up to about um, a nine inch radius and an 18 inch circle with this one. So I'm gonna make a couple of uh, modifications on this one. Maybe I won't route it out that deep so the, the, the nut will hold a little tighter. Hey Alex, yes. a couple quick questions on that. First off, where do you get that really thick plexiglass? Oh, plexiglass. So this is from a box. Um, it was some surplus plexiglass, so I chopped it up. And I've been using plexiglass for a lot of different projects. And I like to use plexiglass on most of my projects I can see um, behind the, the router and also on, um, on other tools. I forgot which one. But this is just surplus stuff. Uh, it was a plexiglass box, a case or whatever, so I just cut it up. And normally, well. Uh, I got a source on that. Uh, there's a company called uh, Piedmont Plastics. Oh, yeah. They're, they're on the Piedmont. same road as uh, G Brave Stadium. You got to buy a whole big sheet of stuff? Yeah. What I do is I call up ahead of time, tell them what thickness I'm looking for, and ask them if they got any drops. Cool. Which they, they usually do. I've, I've never been disappointed. You may have to buy a little bit more than what you what you expected, but they've got uh, they've got all kinds of thicknesses and stuff there. And use good blades also, or, or bits, to get a nice clean <coughs> edge. Uh, be careful if your blade is chipped, so you don't get like chattering. And also make sure you clamp your projects properly, or else it, can, it could get away from you. Um, so there's been a couple of, well, on here I kind of chipped it out or whatever, not holding it properly and clamping it. I should have. Okay, so the next circle cutting jig will be for my bandsaw. Uh, this one is partly 
almost finished. I still have to put the runner in um, in here to fit in my um, my um, the um, track. So I'm using the uh, Craftsman um, size track so to fit my Craftsman table on my on my bandsaw. Uh, so I have to buy a runner that fits the Craftsman um, um, track. So this one here. What, what I normally do for the band, so I usually just put a piece of wood and put a nail in there from the way from the blade. And then, so I have to keep doing that each time or whatever. And I kept looking on YouTube to find something adjustable. So Jerry did the same, pretty much the same idea, having that little sled part, that little um, um, part that slides in there, and then you could move it around for different dimensions. So what I wanted to do was, uh, I was thinking about using the um, draw slides as a means to, to get that, and then I was gonna tap it and drill Put a screw in there. But this stuff here is actually available at Peachtree and other areas. These are the, um, the tracks and the uh, T-bar combo. And actually, it's a nice um, item to use for jigs. So I, I'm going to use that for my um, router table. I'm going to do another router table. So these are pretty cool. So what I did here was I routed out the groove for this part and measured where the saw blade would be and I put this tape, um, this, um, it's a double sided, um, it's a sticky sided tape, I bought this online, the Camelon um, measuring tape and it's nice and almost pretty flush, maybe I could have grooved it out to make it flush, but it, it's fine. And um, so this part here, you could put it to whatever radius you want on here and just tighten it down. And just tighten it down with this knob back here, which I just tapped in there. And this will hold it tight on there. And the way this thing is supposed to work, after I get my runner in here on my, um, Band saw is actually I set my this way. I set my stock piece in here um, a little bit larger than the circle I'm trying to cut. Place it on here on the hole on the bit actually, and then push this up into the band saw until the blade cuts it, and then after that rotate the uh, the stock around, and then I make make my circle. So this thing here. So if you notice, I have this little. Um, notation here about adding 12 inches. So I marked over here where this would be the dimensions for the ruler here. And then if I take it out, I could actually get it to a larger circle. And maybe up to, um, I'll be able to cut maybe a, a 24 inch, close to 24 inch circle, maybe a 48 inch um, item. Can you get that in advance? Yeah. Yeah, they'll be on my bandsaw because, oh, the other thing too, what you want to do is after you clamp it down, so this part here, having the stock in here, I would have to put a block of wood to support this, this part here. But this part is still on my bandsaw. This part always sits on the bandsaw. Yeah, so these are pretty cool. I, I like this, um, these um, T-bar and uh, the miter track. It could be pretty useful, pretty powerful. Any questions about anything? No, it's great. Okay. Anyway, thanks for coming out today. Have a great day. Thank you.